Uh-oh, it looks like we piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially? and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business, strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever need them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything. When I watch that commercial, it's funny because it actually just happened. And uh, for those of you who went to the hideout this last weekend, you saw the transformation. I, we got 12 guys together and we had so many speakers come in and every single person said the exact same thing. They said, we actually don't need any speakers because the 12 of us coming together, um, it, we, we, they were speaking life to each other. They were lifting each other up and they all walked away so filled up. Uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. I came off a high weekend. So uh, if I've got crazy energy today, um, <laughs> you'll have to actually don't excuse me. I, I won't apologize for it. I, I just love this life. So um, I, I am so uh, honored to have this man on the podcast. We were talking before we started off and I told him, you know, I get to travel around the world. I've been around some of the greatest speakers, the Tim stories of the world. Um, I've been, a, you know, in, in places where uh, the Greg Reeds of the world, some of the greatest speakers that, that, that you can ever imagine and what people aspire to be. And I got a chance, I've got a chance to see him two or three times. And this is one of the best speakers I've ever heard in my entire life because he wasn't trying to impress anybody. Um, he was very non-apologetic about what he talked about and he helped me to realize that you didn't have to choose one side or the other that that all roads lead to the exact same uh, place and you know it was a real time and he's got some stories about Michael Jordan which is gonna blow your mind um, but mostly it's a, a, a story of humility. It's a story of humility, of, of faith, and um, just being able to serve people at the highest level. And also, I think one of the coolest things is being a man of his word and being there with you present because everyone's clamoring for his uh, attention after he spoke and just lit the stage on fire. And I walked up and it was like everyone just went away. And he looked me in my eyes and for those 10, 15 seconds, he was completely present with me. Um, so I, I'm so honored to be able to have on the show. Please welcome senior pastor of the Clovis Hills Community Church, Mr. Sean. Don't call me Beatty, Beatty. <laughs> Bro, you got me blushing. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, let's let's jump right in. You talk about like uh, the the episode is is called the the science of faith, and um, I think a lot of times people have to choose. And I had a girl on the uh, plane yesterday. I was talking with her, and she sat down and she was struggling because um, you know she was raised in a very fundamentalist uh, family, and then she uh, studied biology, and she was like, I just had this conflict, and I was like, I couldn't face my parents because I was studying science and they were saying, you need to have faith. And you're the first person that I've ever seen be able to bring the two together. How have you been able to do this? You know, that that's been a, a quite a journey for me, you know, and I, I still, um, I'm still headed there, if that makes sense. I don't know if you, you ever arrived, but I just, it's it's a it's a certainty certainty to me that my faith is 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 real, and that the God I believe in is real, and the evidence um, in the 
the world in the universe, everywhere we go, it points to the, the, a designer. It points to someone who is, um, who's made this thing and made us and it's written in our hearts too. So, um, just along the way, I had those struggles too, where it felt like I needed to be, uh, you know, I, I, I needed to believe either the earth was, you know, 6,000 years old and that the whole place got created in six literal days or, um, what is the evidence for the universe and the world? And the deeper I looked into the Bible and the biblical story, um, actually, the more it pointed to, to truth, to um, that, that God has created the heavens and the earth. And it didn't matter if it was six days or six billion years. Either way, the story is that God has made us and our relationship from him has been broken. And, and how does that get fixed? Ultimately, it wasn't, it was more the why God created the earth and what happened than how, if that makes sense. So I, I you know, I've, I've wrestled with that uh, science and faith for a long time. But what I found is that all truth points to God because he's the author of truth. So ultimately, uh, when science finds something true, uh, I think if you, if you look hard enough, you're going to see the creator in that process. So uh, the reason why I wanted to jump into meat right away is because, I mean, you are like, you take people on a journey when you speak. Like, it, it, I, I was so entrenched. I, I think I have probably five pages of notes uh, from your uh, from the last time that you spoke, and it was it was incredible. Let's go back to the construction of Sean, right? Because right. here's this man of faith that everybody thinks shops at a different grocery store that doesn't eat. Like he's he's a senior pastor, so like you don't shop at the same grocery store. You go to a pastor grocery store that everything's blessed, and then you <laughs> yeah. drive a car that's blessed, and you don't have any crazy circumstances in your life, and you you live like you know uh, uh, above uh, above this, and you're you're a man of the cloth, so you have to be in this. But what I realized is that you're a real dude that went through real challenges and your faith is based off of your your life and living as a human being. So let's go back to that young Sean. I mean, did you come out the womb, you know, praising and being like, yo, everybody follow Jesus or how was it, Sean? No, I, I grew up in a pretty irreligious home, to be honest. Uh, my my mom and dad were good people and they I, I, th I think they had a basic... Uh, fear and knowledge of God, but we didn't go to church as a family. We didn't do things like that. So that was, um, you know, something a little later in life, my neighbors would take me to church and that was cool. Um, and I, I learned about Jesus and all that, but I, I didn't have like a, you know, this deep faith. Um, it probably wasn't until I was a teenager that I got serious about it. And then, you know, throughout my life, I've struggled and, and, worked on it and walked away from it and, and, and walked back to it. And just, um, God has been really patient with me is, is what I would say. I think he's patient with all of us, but, um, in my story, I just see God's patience. Where has God shown his patience? Because I, I think a lot of times, like, and I, I say this a lot with the podcast is my brother told me something that, that was very, very impactful for me. He said, you know, most people are not inspired by your successes. They're inspired by you getting dumped on your head. You know what I mean? And because mm -hmm. then they see that you're real, right? So let's talk, uh, let's talk about some of those struggles that you had with your faith or maybe with your relationship with God. Because like when I tell my friends that I have a relationship with God that I, you know, I'll, I'll yell at them sometimes. I'll be like, yo, you know, <laughs> I mean, if you, you said you're going to bless me and this is happening, what's up, man? Like, where are you at? And, and they're like, you talk to God like, yeah, yeah I do. I mean, cause I want to know. Um, mm -hmm. but, but where has, let's, let's talk about some of those down times or the times where maybe you stepped away from the faith or whatever it was. Yeah. I, when I, when I say stepped away from the faith, I just mean, I was struggling in it. You know, um, uh, when I was a teenager, my mom, got cancer and I, and I had gotten really serious about my relationship with God and Jesus. And, um, when she got cancer and, and ended up dying, um, yeah, that that sent me on a dark one and I never stopped believing, but I, I definitely was not about, uh, following Jesus in certain periods of my life. And, um, it was, it was more like, uh, that's, that's something I believe, but in, in, in some ways I, I, I was, trying to deconstruct that belief so I could go do what I wanted to do, if that makes sense. 
because your your beliefs will shape you and if um there's something you you want to do um you'll change your beliefs so that you can do that it, it's kind of um logical positivism if the, if that that that's a long word but basically what you um choose to believe will really shape who you are because we all we all choose to believe you don't um go search the facts out and all the facts and then believe something usually you choose to believe something and you build a case for those facts um everyone does that that's that is a a human reality a sociological reality and there were periods in my life where i didn't want to follow jesus so i would change my beliefs and um god was always so patient because um what i have found is that god has a will for your life and i have a will for my life and god's will is always better it's always better and god will sit back and go okay you done how's that working <laughs> tell tell me about something that you had you had your will i, I i'll give you an example right so when we started uh, our business, uh, every business that we had, I chose a location and then uh, I, I didn't get it, whether it had been through a lease, they didn't agree with it or whatever it was and we couldn't come to terms. And I was so mad and then I got something that I didn't want and then I looked back at the first one and I was like, I'm so glad that God had his way. Where was that in your life, Sean? And where is that happening right now? Oh man, um, you know, several places, but like, like as a young man, I can't tell you, you know, I had several, um, young women I was very serious about. I thought like, Oh, the one, this is my wife. And like, I look back and I'm like, Oh no, it wasn't. And I'm sure they're very grateful too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, as a pastor, even, um, I, uh, came up here to central California to take over this church. I'm, I passed her now. I've been here 10 years, but I, you know, I lived in Oceanside, California, South Oceanside. I live four blocks from the ocean. I surf. Well, I used to <laughs> kind of a kook now, but, um, you know, like moving to, uh, the Fresno Clovis area, I thought like, what, what is going on? Am I being cursed by God? Is this bad? This, this can't be a good thing. And I got to tell you, uh, moving here has been one of the greatest things uh, in my family's life, in my life, um, in my career as well, too, where um, God really, by me being obedient and coming to the Central Valley, God has blessed me in ways I would have never imagined here. What is what is one of the ways where maybe he's blessed you sideways? And when I say when I say this, like you get it right, you get the blessing and then you're mad at it and you don't see it as a blessing. And then later on, you're like, Oh, I get it. I get it. Like, you know, there's been times where I've lost my, uh, you know, I remember getting fired in, uh, what was it? 2006 on my day off, Sean, like oh. one day, just oh. my boss calling me and be like, yo, you don't need to come to work anymore. And I was like, all right, thank you, God. Like, you know, and I'm in the backyard, the backhoe is dig digging a pool. I'm like, stop. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, like, stop, dude. just leave a pond in the back. I don't need the pool anymore. <laughs> Cause I just lost my job. But it was probably one of the greatest things that happened to me because it helped me to realize that I was putting my work before him. And he yeah. was like, I ain't trying to have that. Now, at the time, I was mad. I, you know, I had some anger issues, stuff like that about it. What, what were some of the things and, you know, whether it be in the past or even in the present that, you know, God has put you in and you've started to kind of war against him. And then you realize that, you know, he's in control. Well, um actually today's a special day um that so four years ago my wife was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor like it's a terminal cancer it was a level four glioblastoma um and it was you know in one day you know we w went to the emergency room didn't did an emergency mri because something we could tell something was wrong they scanned it they said that was on the 28th yesterday. They said, you have a brain tumor. Uh, you need to go into emergency surgery. Uh, we went in the next day on this day and they went in and they began to, you know, try and remove that tumor from her brain. And they gave her nine months to live after the surgery was done. <laughs> and um, that was four years ago. She's still with us today. And um, she's, she's doing well. 
but um you know there's some disabilities that come with that there's some you know there, there's there's trials that come with all of that and it's really easy to be like wait wait a minute after all i've done for you kind of thing but the the truth of the matter is um god has taught her and i it's not me at least i can talk speak for me um really how to be a better husband how to be more present um that uh, really every day that i'm given with my family and with my wife is a gift um gosh just um so much more empathy as you know when people struggle with sickness and people struggle with disability um you know i wouldn't wish it on anyone but there have been so many sideways blessings from her cancer and the fact that she's still with us, like she's a miracle. Four years later, she's still here and um, trucking along and great and no progression in that cancer. And, um, you know, her oncologist always says, I don't know what you're doing, but keep it up. So who taught you how to be a, a husband and a father? You know, there's no manual for it, right? So like you, you learn from your parents, if you had good parents, um, I, I had, I had pretty good parents. Like they, my dad was a, a good father and a good husband. Um, well, he wasn't a Christian one, but he still was very good. And then um, I would watch other men, you know, I, uh, as, as a young man going to church, even when I was kind of working on my testimony, if that makes sense. <laughs> I, I would Hold pull on. around. Sh Sean, Sean, stop right there. Help people to realize when you say working on your testimony, can you, can you dive, can you dive into that one right there? for me please oh for sure I, I was just being a hypocrite you know like i go to church and be like oh yay jesus and then you know the other se six days of the week or seven days of the week even you know i was living my life for myself and i was you know sinning on purpose and not caring and just really um taking advantage of god's grace if that makes sense so um yeah but even when i was in that place i still was going to church and i was around godly men and i would watch how they um reacted how they treated their wives um when they were wrong how they would you know apologize to them and i i was i was taking notes if that makes sense so sean a thing that we were talking about at the hideout and we went over um was we we ingra integrated business into it but what i wanted to people to understand and help them to understand was not to build your house on the sand and this is something that, you know, I, I took from you where it wasn't about all these things that you accumulated in your life or the success that you had in your business or, you know, what the world saw as success, but make sure that you don't build your house on the sand. And some of the guys, you know, they looked at me kind of weird when I said that. And I said, guys, you got to understand that no matter what business you ever want to build or what success or money that you want to come in. If you don't have a solid foundation, and especially you don't have a solid foundation in your family, um, you're going to get all those things, and then it's going to crumble. Um, and when it crumbles, it's, you're going to be in a worse spot than if you didn't even get it in the first place. And so can, can you talk to that a little bit? Because, you know, in a world that's so fast, right, and, I mean, even in the pastor world, Right. And even in the church world where people oh, yeah. are like, you know what? OK, so we're doing good. We got like, you know, 100 people in the church. Now we need to double it. Then we need to double that. Then we mm -hmm. need to make sure that we're expanding here and expanding there and doing all this stuff. How are you able to keep yourself so grounded and have that firm foundation when the world tells you that, you know what, we need to expand and 10x God's kingdom? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's. <laughs> Sometimes it's not much different than the business world, right? You know, in a 10x God's kingdom and um, to stay grounded. I think that the things that have helped me is um, habits in my life, just things that are daily habits that are good habits in my life. Uh, um, you know, the, the, one of the first things I do in the morning is I pray. Um, I read the book of Proverbs. You know, if today's uh, the 29th, I read Proverbs 29. Um, I read, I read a bit of the scripture. I, I, I ground myself in that way. And then it becomes a habit throughout my day. If I'm waiting in line, right. Um, I might pray for the people in front of me or I'll just kind of, um, you know, recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall, you know what I mean? I have these like, and this took years to develop in me. I didn't come out of the womb doing that. Um, 
and and that that's helped me stay grounded and and then having other men around me that live similarly because you know my my dad was a marine and he would always say to me you know um he's from tennessee he'd say boy show me your friends i'll show you your future <laughs> right and it's it's totally true that that's a human principle you will become who you're around so it's surrounding yourself um, with people that are grounded like that. And then when you're off track, you know, you are because you're around those people and they're, they're on track. And when they're off track, they see you on track. So it, it but if, if you're around, um, you know, people that, that are, that are struggling in life and it, there's nothing wrong with that, we should be helping those people too. But if that's the majority of people you're around, um, that'll end up becoming your baseline normal if that makes sense. So if I hang out, if all my friends are all divorced and I have trouble with my wife, that's the first place I'll probably go in my head because they've been through it. They're okay. And, and, and that's a reality of how humans are. You, you know, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. So, um, and, and, and it's not to disparage people that are divorced because like stuff happens, like relationships are, a two way street. And, um, but if, if that's all I surround myself with, then I'll end up kind of taking on this attitude. Well, like Bob did it and he's okay. And Kevin did it and he's okay. And Cindy did it and she's okay. And, and, you know, I'll be okay. Kind of thing. And, um, where if I'm around guys that are like, no, 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 you need to lean in. You, you need to get some counseling. You need to go go talk to someone about this. Sean, you need to keep your side of the street clean. I don't care if your wife is acting a certain way. You need to, how are you gonna behave? Who's the man you're supposed to be? Um, I don't care if she's not meeting your needs or yada, yada, yada. Who are you supposed to be? What was the value you made? Having people that call me to that, man, um, cause I'll just, on my own, I'll just kind of drift off because you know, I want to be the boss of my life. I want to do what I want to do. And that's not always the best thing for me. So you, you mentioned something and I want to, I want to go into this part of it. You mentioned prayer, just like passing the potatoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you said, I just pray for this person. Or I wake up in the morning and I pray. And I, I think a lot of times people out there don't understand like the construction of it or what is it? So yeah. could, if, if we were talking to a, a four year old, five year old, maybe, and you had to break down how to pray. How would you do it, Sean? You know, there's a bunch of di different methods to do it. Um, I, I've just found that the, the simplest way for me is um, it started with talking to God, but like, you, you know, you just talk, right? And you were talking about how you'll just speak in your own language to God. And, um, and that works, th that, that is prayer in its essence, in its simplest form. Um, what I found though, is if I just started talking to God, like I, I must have like this crazy sense of spiritual ADD. Cause I'll be like, Oh, Hey God, thank you for today, man. I could use a burrito right now. Oh, maybe I'll go to Alberto's and then I'll, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just off on a tangent, like right away. So I needed things to like really help me like stay focused and I still struggle with it. So, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll use like, a just a simple little acrostic acts a c t s right and a stands for adoration so i'll i have a little notebook and i'll just write down four or five of the things that i i i love about god or i like about god or what what's you know yeah i i i praise him for and it could it could be some you know sometimes it could be something simple it could be lord lord i just praise you for the breath i have today I, I, I love you because you're so patient with me. I love you because you've really, um, you brought me so far in life and I'll write a few of those things down. And sometimes they're the same things every day. I, I like, I'm not creative. Um, and then C is confession. Right. And I'll, then I'll just confess my, my sin to him because I sin every day. Like everyone's a sinner. Um, I don't care how great your grandma is. She's still a sinner. It's just what humans are. The Bible talks about it, that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I'll just say, and you know, I'll write it down again because writing helps me like stay focused. I'll just write it in a journal. I'll just be like, Lord, um, I'm a sinner. I need, 
please, please forgive me of my sin and purify me from my unrighteousness. If there's anything specific I need to confess to you, would you just reveal it to my heart right now? And then I'll just sit quiet for like 30 seconds. And if something pops up and sometimes it's a, a list and sometimes it's nothing, but if, if it's a list, I'll write, I'll write them out. And then I'll um, just, I don't leave it in the journal because I don't want my kids like later in life being like, what? He struggled with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I want someone finding it and canceling me. Because um, <laughs> pastors sin. We do. We, wait, like, we're, wait a like, second. Pa- hey, Sean, pastors sin? Yeah. You do. They, okay. All right. All right. I'm grown men. I struggle with my flesh, all of that. So I'll write those out. And then um, I'll... I'll write forgiven over him. I'll just scratch over all of it so you can't read it forgiven. And I've just always remembered this verse, First uh, John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all our unrighteousness. And what that means is um, I don't need to pay for my sins. I don't need to go do push-ups or go help old ladies across the street. Jesus has already paid for it. So I, I, I'm forgiven. And then I just kind of take a moment and go and, and kind of rest in that and be like, and thank you, Lord. Thank you. Right? So A, C, and then T is thanks. And then I start thanking him for things. Lord, thank you for Kelly, my wife. Um, thank you for another day with her. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my health. And I'll just go through several things I'm thankful for. And then the S is a religious word, supplication. It just means asking for things. And then I'll just kind of make a list of people I'm praying for, things in my life I'm praying for, um, stuff like that. And it takes me... You know, it used to be about a two minute process in my life. And now it can be 30 minutes on a, on some days it's an hour, um, you know, and it's kind of like a muscle. Like it's something as you do over your life, you, it becomes easier to do prayer becomes easier to do. But I always tell guys like, just start with a minute or two and just kind of be mindful of the moment that you're in God's presence and, you know, tell tell them something you love about them, confess your sin to them thank him for some things and then ask him for a few things because he's your father and he loves you. So Sean, let's go back to the, the teenage, teenage years, because I I don't know. I mean, I don't know many people and you might be the only one, but uh, in the teenage years, we have the tendency to, like you said, you, you, you have a desire and then you convince yourself of the reason why you should be believing that. And then you find all this evidence in life. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the exact word that you used. It was a long one. Um, what was the word that you used that where we where logical we logical positivism? So <laughs> Anthony Blue is a philosopher at um, uh, I believe Oxford or Cambridge, and he had come up with that kind of phrase. So when we when we're in that spot, right? So generally, it's the teenager side. Let's take it to the teenager side of you when you're going oh. through because. We're trying to find our own way, no matter what our mom told us. I remember my mom told me that in fourth grade that she was praying for my wife, and I was like, you're weird. This is weird. I'm in fourth grade. Like, I'm trying to just go out with so-and-so, and and she's the cutest chick in school, and that's why I'm trying to holler at her. You know what I mean? I ain't trying to find some, you know, perfect wife. I'm glad that she did pray for my wife, because now I have a wife that my mom prayed for, and having a godly woman in my life is amazing. Yeah. But... The reality is when we're a teenager, let's talk about Sean and some of those challenges that you went through as a teenager, um, you know, uh, when, you, when you started to maybe question God about those things. I think I dropped out on uh, Sean for a second. Hopefully we'll be able to get him back. Um, but these are the kind of questions that for me are so large in life because my, uh, my friend uh, Will and I, we were talking and when we were uh, chatting about it, he told me that, um, you know, a lot of times people that are in the faith have the tendency to um, turn more people away than anybody else. And so this is a, this, this has been a challenge for me because, you know, uh, I think a lot of times people will have the tendency to um, project themselves as, you know, holier than now or whatever it is in the struggle part. I think that we have Sean back and he's back now. Yeah, sorry so, about that. Sean, what I was what I was saying is is a lot of times like my friend Will and I, we were talking and he said that, you know, a lot of times Christians turn more people away from Jesus than anybody else because um, they're either shouting in the person's face, like, you need to do X, you need to change your life, you need to do this. And, 
you know, it, it's like as opposed to just walking alongside of them and loving those people exactly where they were. I don't remember any place in the Gospels, and maybe I just didn't read the right ones, where Jesus was standing on top of a, a hill shouting at people that you have to do X. Now he was showing it and he was walking alongside of the people. Can you talk to that part of it? Because I think a lot of times whenever you bring out faith to someone, again, they jump back to a, a side of like, no, I believe in science or I believe in X, so I can't believe in this. How do you merge the two, man? Yeah, so, um, gosh, that's a, that's, a, that's a big question. I would tell you right away, um, you're right about Jesus. Like, I, I, I live by, Eugene Peterson was a guy I looked up to. He's an author and a pastor. And um, he said this once, and I, I kind of live by it, is that um, people are not projects to be fixed, um, but mysteries to be wondered at. And they're, they're perfectly capable of um, being used by God in what, whatever state they're in. So I don't need to get pe people to act better if that makes sense, especially because I think people sniff that out. They realize like, well, you need to act better too. Why are you telling me to act better? Uh, I'm just working on, on, on me trying to obey God and, and follow Jesus and come alongside people where they're at and, and, and help them find their way. Cause everyone kind of matures spiritually at a different rate and a different path. And for me, it was never up and to the right. It was always I kind of meandered, you know, back and forth and, you know, but over the, over the long term, it was up and to the right. Um, and I think when it comes to belief, it's not even just a, a teenage thing. Um, this is what human beings do is we, we choose to believe something and then we build a case for it. So there, there are people out there that will choose um, to not believe in God. That's a belief system. Like you can say, no, I don't have any faith. Like, no, you, you're putting faith in that, in a belief. That is a belief system. Science is a belief system. And they, they chose that before they had all the facts. And then they began building a case the rest of their life. You know, I'll hear people like, well, I was in college. I started studying biology. And then I, you know, I came to the conclusion there's no God and religion is a farce. And, and it's like, well, okay, I, I understand that. Um, but did you study all the facts while you took a biology class in college or you were a biology major? No, at some point you made a choice and then you began to go down that road and study that way, right? In the same way, when it comes to faith, that's, a, that's the same thing. At some point you make a choice to believe something. Um, I, I made a choice to believe in Jesus and then I began to build that case, right? The rest of my life, I, you know, I went to seminary, I got my doctorate, I, you know, I, I started working for a church, like I, I went that way. Um, and the reality is, um, it's not an either or though, because as I was going that way of faith, I, I'm looking at the world around me, I'm looking at um, what science says, and then I began reading, reading the Bible, and in many ways, they don't conflict. They both point to um, a some some kind of creator. And ultimately, you can you know, if if the if there is no God, and um, the world life came from non life, and it just suddenly happened um, a couple billion years ago, and um, when you die, you die, and that's it, and you'll never be remembered again, and there's, there's none of that. Within three, four generations, you're, you're forgotten, and you move on, um, then, okay, then, then, then that's how it is. I want you to think about the, that, though. Um, if you're right, and you believe in science, and, 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 or the traditional, I believe, I believe in science, right, to quote, um, what is that, Nacho Libre, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, the, like, okay, when you die, you just don't exist anymore. Then how does that hurt a person of faith? If that is true, it doesn't hurt me at all. As a matter of fact, like, you know, I lived my life, um, following the ethic of Jesus, which I think almost every human on the, the planet believes, well, that's a good thing, whether they believe he's the Lord or not. But if I'm right, if there is a God and he did create you and he does know you and he, and, and, and he wants a relationship with you and you're wrong, 
and you've chosen to reject him and you've just said, well, you know, there's no God. I'm just warm food when I die. See, if you're wrong, that's going to be a time of deep regret, if that makes sense. And Blaise Pascal, um, the Danish philosopher, he talked about that and he called it the divine bet. So what are you going to bet your life on? And if you bet your life on science, that's fine. But um, if you end and it's wrong, th that's a bad day. I can bet my life on Jesus Christ and still believe in science. Like I, I get b the best of both worlds. So that, that's where I've never understood why it had to be either or. Because um, if, you know, here, here's a great example. Um, you know, like all matter, everything on this planet, right? It's all, it's all particles. It's all atoms. It's all held together, right? And when you look at it at an atomic level, it's, you know, there's like this little, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's these little electrons bouncing around this molecule, and because these electrons bounce around randomly, they, they have no pattern to them whatsoever. Science cannot figure out the pattern. They just bounce around randomly. It holds all matter together. Like it, matter sticks together because of that. You know, and science has no, like they'll never know why it does that. But I, I, but I as I read the scripture, I look at the scripture and I look in Colossians and it says in him, Christ Jesus, all things are held together because he's the one that spoke all things into existence. And there's so many times that, um, yeah, the, the, the Bible doesn't always speak to science. It doesn't tell us, you know, it, it's like trying to find the iPhone in the Bible. It's not there, right? So you, you can't always find the scientific principle. But what you will find along the way is that God created the earth. He created the laws of physics. He created biology. He created beings. He created humans. He created all of those things. And, and there is a maker to it. And his name is Jesus Christ. So like I see the science and the Bible working together rather than apart. And it, it, it's almost like it's, it's kind of a reflection of our culture, too is, you know, you have people that'll be like, well, you either believe God's way or you believe the devil's way, right? Um, but it's not always that way. Sometimes we're just not seeing it the way the way it really is. Religion's not seeing it that properly and God and or science is not seeing it properly. And there might be, the, the, I, I, I believe most times we end up on the same hill. <laughs> we're climbing the mountain a different way and we get to the same place and go, oh, you know, Stephen Hawking talks about this thing called the singularity that happened at the Big Bang, right? The moment the universe went from like this tiny compressed like speck of dust to, you know, boom, being as, as big as it is, right? And he calls it the singularity. Well, okay, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light. That's the singularity. Like you, these things are there. And if, if you'll just come with kind of like a rational mind, you realize like, oh, they both came to the same place. They just said it differently. Mm. So, Sean, I, and I believe you were talking about this, but if you weren't, then I heard somebody talk about it. But I believe it was you that were that you were talking about um, fiction, nonfiction writing and the, the, the periods in which they did this. Am I correct on this? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, can you talk to that? Because this blew my mind um, when I was thinking about it. Because a lot of people ha have the argument, too, that, you know what, this is just a bunch of stories. You know what I mean? And can you yeah. break this down? Because when I started writing, the, like, I was taking the notes from you. Um, and it was it was blowing my mind because... For me, I like to be able to challenge the the belief systems that that people have or I have, and no more did it ever happen as when I went to Taiwan and mainland China. Mm. The reason why is because if you have never been to Ma have you been to mainland? Uh, I haven't been to mainland China. No. Have you been to Taiwan? Yeah. Okay, so I, I lived in Taiwan as a, a young kid. My dad was stationed there. And then I got the chance to go back. So I went to Taiwan and I went to, uh, to uh, mainland China, to Shanghai. And we did a couple of cities in Taiwan. 
we flew in. It was funny because at the time I had an afro. And then my buddy, who's six six, had just shaved his head. So you can imagine what this looks like when we're going through uh, customs. And mm-hmm. I looked around, and not one person looked like me. Not one. Yeah. I looked around, and I was like, wow, this is, I mean, this, I've never been in this spot before. And then as we began to connect with the culture and dive into the culture, nobody believed like what we believed. And so I had to question myself, do I just believe what I believe because I believe it and because I've been told it? And so I wanted to be able to challenge these things. But this, when you were talking about the fiction, nonfiction writing, this part really, really drove some stuff home for me. Can you break it down? Yeah. So um, here's a great example. A lot of times when people read the Bible or that, like, let's, let's take the New Testament. Let's take Jesus, for example. Um, or actually, let, let's start at a, big, a bigger, like the, the, the way the Bible's put together. So the Bible um, is a collection of books, right? And it's different types of literature. So sometimes like we, sometimes the way people interpret the Bible, like we, Christians even interpret it poorly, you know, um, you know, like there's places in the Bible, like when you read the Psalms, that's poetry, right? So um, when it says, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after you, does that mean your soul is it? is a deer and it always needs water. Like, no, it, that, that's a, that's kind of using poetry to describe a concept of a longing for God. Right. So you have to interpret the type of literature that the Bible is writing in. Right. So if you read the gospels, the stories about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, a lot of people say, Oh, those were made up. You know, those were just made up stories about Jesus to, to, to teach morals or to, you know, now they'll say to, you know, to support the patriarchy or something like that. Um, When the reality is, is that's the farthest thing from the truth that there's, there's, there's no science in that whatsoever. As a matter of fact, what literary scholars will tell you, Robert Alter was a, um, he's a professor at Berkeley and he's not a Christian. He writes about this and he says, one of the reasons we know the new Testament accounts are, um, historical documents they're not just fables or stories made up is because they use real places and real people and real historical things and when we like when we read a story now if you read you know you're reading a book and you read a harry potter right and it's like you know or or twilight actually you know you read twilight and it's like, and Edward went to Seattle and he stood in the Seattle moonlight and the moonlight glistened off the space needle onto his face. And, you know, it's using all of these real places and he pondered the presidency of George W. Bush. And, you know, and then, and they, they, they quote like real political figures, real, real humans in history, all of that, but it's a fictional story. We read those and we're, that's normal to us, but you have to understand in the first century, when the, the new Testament was written, that kind of writing didn't exist. And when they used real places and real historical figures and, and, and real people in an account, like that type of fiction didn't exist. And in order for that to be a made up story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you have to understand this. They would have had to get in a DeLorean and go 88 miles an hour and go to the future with doc Brown to the, the to about the 17th 18th century and learn how to write that kind of fiction and then go back to the first century in the DeLorean and write it but but we make these assumptions all the time because we think we're modern people and we're smarter than than people in previous so uh, I think we lost Sean again but um, it, one of these things is is when when Sean talked to me about this it really, really got me to start to think because I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, for me, well, like I was tell, telling you guys about going to um, Taiwan or China or, you know, going to different countries, especially in Asia, when you go, you see things that are not exactly the way that you believe. And so, Sean, let me ask you this. As a pastor, as a man of the cloth, that you know the Bible, I mean, you're able to quote scripture, all those things. Where in the Bible do you have a challenge? Because, I, I'm, I, I mean, I believe, I, I mean, I don't have the education that you do. I don't have the DR in front of my name. Uh, I'd like mm-hmm. to do that. I'd like to do that just so my wife will call me doctor, not for anybody else. <laughs> I don't even want to get the education. I just want my wife to be address me 
as doc. Yeah, yeah. Would... My, my wife and kids won't do it. So, okay. yeah, I, good luck. <laughs> well, I would make her. I would be like, look, I'm a doctor. You better, you better handle this. But I remember there was a, 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 a scripture where it talked about uh, women being quiet. And I yeah. was like, man, I love my mama. If I was to tell my mama, you need to be quiet and don't talk, uh, you know, in public and then just ask. And when you get home, I, I mean, and I have a daughter and I want to raise her like that. Now, I sense have learned the context of what it was, but I had a challenge with that verse. Is there things in the Bible that you have a challenge with that you're that you're working through with God right now? Oh, that's a really good question. Um. Yeah, there, there are some things where I just have to choose to live by faith on. So like, like, like there, there's, a, there's a place in um, in the book of Romans where the Apostle Paul, he, he's it's Romans 8, 28. And he says, for all things work for the good of those who love God. Right. Um, and I. I watch. You know, I, I'm a pastor. I do funerals. I, I go to visit people as they're dying. I, I, I pray over them as they're dying. Like, I, I see, like, deep tragedy happen in people's lives, if that makes sense. And um, it doesn't always feel like all things are working for the good, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, now, I have to come to a place where um, I also have to be humble and realize, like, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've only seen so much. I don't have an eternal perspective. I don't know what something looks like beyond the grave. Um, I, I have a limited perspective, if that makes sense. Um, my, But I, I struggle with it. And there's a story in my upbringing that um, helps me come to peace with it, if this makes sense, is I remember... Um, I was about six years old and um, they thought I had spinal meningitis and um, which is, you know, pretty, pretty deadly. And um, I had to go to the hospital and um, they had to perform. They, I think they ended up doing five spinal taps on me in a, in a period of like two weeks, which a spinal tap is awful. Awesome movie, awful procedure, especially for a six year old. And I remember after the like, probably third one I was not having it and the doctors came in and I knew exactly what they were coming to do and it was not going to happen and I was screaming and I was biting and I was kicking and they were holding me and I was moving and they couldn't get the needle and they were worried I was going to you know break the needle or whatever and I I the door opened and I remember my dad walking in and my my dad was a um, marine 32 years fought in the Korean war three tours in Vietnam he was a bad man. He was tough as nails. And um, he came walking in and I saw my dad and I said, my dad's here to rescue me from these guys. Because as far as I was concerned, these doctors, these nurses were out to get me and hurt me. And he grabbed me because they were holding me down. And he moved them aside and he grabbed me and he scooped me up in his arms and he looked at me and he looked at me lovingly. I was like, oh. And then he just proceeded to like put me in a headlock with my hands and my feet. And he exposed my spine to those doctors so that I could not move. And they jammed that needle in me. And when he was done, the sense of betrayal I felt on him. Right? So I look back now and I realize like, oh, you know, I had a limited view as a six year old kid. I thought these people were trying to kill me. I thought my dad betrayed me. But the reality is he had a much better perspective than I had. He was there to help save my life. Um, I, I think because I don't have eternal perspective, I struggle with that. All things work for the, for the good. So I just have to believe that God has a bigger view of things. And I'm not seeing the whole picture, if that makes sense. So if, if God was here right now, right? Well, we could, I mean, we know he's here with us, right? But I'm yeah. saying like, he shows up in your office by that uh, wrestling belt uh, up on your uh, up on your yeah. shoulder, right? I don't know what that wrestling belt is, but that's cool, man. I, I wish I had. One. <laughs> God shows up in person. He's he's uh -huh. like, yo, get off the podcast real quick. Um, you know, shut your camera off. Uh, do whatever. But I need to have a I need to have a conversation with you. And he sits down. And he says, okay, I got 
maybe two minutes. Then I got to get back to my, I always thought that my God was always on fluffy clouds. I used to think as a kid, he would jump from cloud to cloud. I thought that that's what he did. Like when I would see the clouds, that's the way I uh, pictured him. You know, obviously in yeah. Talladega nights, he had, uh, he, had I like he, <laughs> he had wings, you know what I mean? Sweet baby Jesus did. <laughs> So he's sitting there with you. He said, look, I got two minutes, then I'm going back to the fluffy clouds or I'm going back to the wings or I'm going back to wherever. And um, I need you to ask me the things that you've had in your heart that you've been struggling with and I'm here and I will answer them. What question would you ask God right now? Wow. Um, yeah, I would ask God about just... Um, some of my loved ones that are struggling in their faith and, and people I've prayed for and why they're still struggling and, and why won't you reveal yourself to them? Um, that would, that would be the question I'd ask today right now. What would be the hardest, um, the hardest situation to be able to explain to people because again a lot of times people have a certain belief system or their their faith is you know they talk about uh you know i you have the verse but it's where the seed drops and it drops on the rocky ground and then on the uh, mm -hmm. you know and it gets choked out by the weeds or you know things like that a lot of times people have a little bit of faith and then a circumstance hits them pow and then cause them to just draw back and be like yo you know, yeah. I'm going to judge God on man's inconsistencies, right? Yeah. Maybe they yeah. got abused in the church. Maybe, yeah. maybe their dad lost their job. They were serving and they were giving money and the pastor just did them wrong or the church did them wrong or mm -hmm. all these things. Can you talk to that person out there? Because a lot of times that person is like, you're talking about this God. You're talking about this Jesus. Well, I was, you know, when I was 12 years old. And, you know, maybe I was in church and, you know, the pastor, the priest or the person of power took advantage of me. And now I don't want to have nothing to do with that God. Um, well, one, I, I, I can I can empathize with them on that because um, there was a punk band called The Blamed and they had an album called The Church is Hurting People. Right. And that that can go several ways just that phrase right there right the church is hurting people um the the church is full of a lot of hurting people um and then hurt people hurt people as, as well too and um i i can understand sometimes when you have your um when you've been hurt by something like that's the last place you want to go but what I would tell you is any group you're part of, like your family hurts you, but you know, you don't, well, some people do disown their family. Right. But then you, you pick up another community. Like no one lives on an Island alone. If you, if you rejected your family, you go pick up another community that becomes like family to you. And if they hurt you, you don't reject them instantly based on what your other family did. If, if that makes sense. And um, really your, your belief, my belief cannot be based on how other people have lived their faith out, if that makes sense. Um, be, because my belief isn't in those other people. Hmm. And, and, but that, that's the pro person of Jesus. The person of Jesus has not failed me. Um, but I've had pastors that have, I've had, you know, uh, people that have done me wrong in church. I've, I've had all of that. Um, but I also have done people wrong and, and, and sometimes, uh, yeah, I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up on Jesus because other people have, you know, the, the, the Christianity is not about, um, what Christians believe it's about who Jesus is. Right. And if I was falling from a cliff to my demise and there's a branch hanging out and I, I don't like contemplate 
grabbing it or not. I don't go, oh, should I grab that branch to see if it'll save me? Um, and I don't go, well, I've grabbed branches before and they broke and that one looks like it'll break. No, I'm falling to my demise. <laughs> I'm grabbing the branch and it's not my faith in the branch that's going to save me. It's going to be the strength of the branch, right? Well, I think sometimes we equate the church and Christians with the branch and we're not. Jesus is the branch. And um, yeah, the church and Christians will fail you and it's full of hypocrites, but that's why we welcome you too. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like every human that, that, that is, is a hypocrite. Like that, that is a reality to it. Um, we pick on politicians a lot. I do. I pick on politicians a lot for all their hypocritical views. But the, the truth of the matter is like that is just kind of the flawed nature of human beings. But Jesus is the branch that saves you ultimately. Um, so th that's why I would say Jesus hasn't given up on his church. That's why I can't either, though, if that makes sense, as flawed and as broken as it is. Because I've also seen where it's really changed the world. It's changed places. It's done incredible good. Um, you know, you're never going to turn on the news or pick up your news feed and find like a great story about a church that's changing lives. It's always going to be about a mega church pastor that cheated on his wife or stole some money or, or, you know, is accused of something bad. That that's the nature of news. Anyways, it's limbic. It's to get you to go, Oh, oh to get upset or scared or, you know, what, what not. But the ultimate question is, will the branch save you? Is it strong enough? Not is my faith in it strong enough or are other people's faith in it strong enough? So, Sean, when you talked about the the super pastors or the the mega church pastors and things like that, uh, I want to I want to go into that part of it because, you know, a lot of times what I notice is when a person is as charismatic as you are, as great of a speaker as you are, a lot mm -hmm. of times people get their minds focused on you, and but I've noticed this humility, and that's the reason why I was so attracted and wanted you to be on the show is because. Like, it's almost like you're, uh, you know, I'm a huge Tennessee fight, Titan fan. Everybody out there knows that I'm a ten I'm an irrational Tennessee Titans fan. Even <laughs> though we're two and one right now, we are still going 15 yeah. and two. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or no, no, we're, we're one and two, actually. One and two. So we're going to yeah, go, yeah. we're going to finish out the year strong, 15 and two. Uh, we'll have home field throughout the playoffs. We'll win the Super Bowl. And they'll, they won't even talk about those two uh, losses at the first of the, uh, you know. So this is how it goes. But in those things, right, I don't yeah. even know where I was because I got uh, sidetracked with the Titans. Help me where I, help, <laughs> yes, help me where I, I was. I, yeah. Um, gosh, I got sidetracked. So I started oh, thinking mega about churches. My, uh, mega churches, okay? Yeah, yeah. So with mega churches, a lot of times people get, like the, the pastors, and I've watched this happen. I've watched them, whether it be social media, whatever it was, and it becomes uh, like, I don't know if you saw the, the movie John, uh, Joan of Arc, the, the original one with Mia, Mia Hohovich, or I don't know how to say her last yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, that okay. was great. So there was three things that happened in that movie, and I asked my friend if he saw him. He didn't see him at the time, but I, I asked him, but I saw it, and it was like the first battle. She said, if you love God, you will follow me. And because God had told her, go into battle, and there's less of them, and she went in, and she just smashed everybody. Second sure. one, she said, if in the middle of the movie, and if you watch the movie, she said, if you love me and God, or if you love God and me, you'll go yeah. into battle. They went in, and half of her people died. They still won, but half of her people died. At the end... She said, if you love me, you will go into battle with me. And she went in, and that's when she died. And all her, all her people died. I don't know that she died at that point, but all her people died. And it was a bad war and all that stuff. Yeah. And this is the way that I see a lot of times churches go, is yeah. more people, and, and even in community, if you're out there and you have a, uh, I'm, not saying, I'm not calling you out and telling you you're bad in this, but a lot of people will be like, yo, you need to come to my church. Yeah. Because my pastor, Sean, is the baddest on the planet. Mm -hmm. And then Sean is, Pastor Sean, it happens to not be there that week. And a lot of people come walking out. It's like, oh, I wish I would have known that Pastor Je Sean wasn't there because, yeah. you know, I could have went and had some breakfast with my family. How do yeah. you keep the congregation from seeing you as a God as you move forward? 
Yeah, that um, I'm going to be honest. That's like something I'm I'm always afraid of because um, it is so easy to drink your own Kool Aid. Like human beings, we lie to ourselves all the time, and I think a lot of like, you know, um, say celebrity pastors that have that have um, fallen in the last few years is um, I I don't Sean, know. Sean, them, but can I can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you even have a challenge with that term? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so I can, can we can we sit can we ground in that for a second because sure. I have noticed and I, I watched uh, again social media I read a book of one guy and I was like wow this is amazing amazing man of God and then I started watching him over and over and it's not from a judgment standpoint but I started watching him and I was like how many kids are watching this and watching the flashy this and the flashy that and all this stuff and then you start preaching the prosperity gospel you know yeah. what I'm saying and it's like it's you know if you praise Jesus then you're gonna get Get X, and it's like eh, I don't know that that's right. Yeah. I mean, it, do yeah. you think that there's a special place for them to go when they, when they die? Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I'm joking with you, man. I'm kidding with you. Well, well, here's the thing, though. I, I think most of those guys start off with really great intentions. Got it. And um, the mach- there's there's this fame machine that everyone has tried to glom onto and um it it'll it it will corrupt you like there's no one above it if that makes sense yeah um i know like if you know my church i you know on a given weekend there there's a couple thousand people that will will come or watch and and that that's great and it's awesome but you know let, let's say suddenly like one of my sermons went viral and it had a couple million views and we go from every week to, you know, a couple thousand people watching to a hundred thousand people. Right. And then there's all this adulation pouring in. Um, there's, there's, you know, giving pours in the, you know, you're having to manage that success. You're hiring people for, you know, you're going from a staff of, you know, 20 something people. Now you've got 300 people and they're all relying on you. And there's this machine and you've got to keep that coming in to keep these people that you love employed. And then, and the devil is real. Like he is real and he uses all of that. He uses success. And CS Lewis talked about it, that pride is the greatest of sins. And the, the way it's the greatest of sins is like, you don't know you have it. And it's rotted you from the inside out. So I, fe- I, to be honest, I fear it because I know I might, I'd probably be the same way. And then, then what happens is you, you're, you're feeding this machine. And then these, these, these poor guys, there's people telling them how amazing they are, you know, or <laughs> how, you know, you're a little fat for camera. So you, you know, you need to work on your abs and you need to, and before you know it, like you're, you're at the gym four hours a week instead of on your knees like there it's it's this awful machine and i like i'm gonna be honest i it's never been thrown on me so i can't say it wouldn't happen to me but i'm afraid of it if that makes sense so like i i i used to go out and try and grow my online following and i've I've actually in the last two two years kind of pulled back the other thing i've realized is like like i don't want people like examining me up close because I'm a sinner. I'm a jerk. <laughs> I don't have a Twitter account anymore because I can't keep my thumbs to myself. I'm snarky. I'm just, you know what I mean? I don't reflect Christ well there. And um, I, I, I just, I think I'm like, I try and like admit my faults as much as possible so that I won't get put on that pedestal. And um, I use a lot of self-deprecating humor Um just to take myself off a pedestal because it can, it, it can happen. It's a scary thing. When was the last time that, that you did have that, like, you know, you, you wanted to shed it a little bit. Like, I'll give you an example. There was a time, uh, I don't know if I told the story on the podcast before, but there was a time where a little boy, I think my daughter was in second grade, third grade, this little boy, I won't say his name cause uh, in, in the community uh, where he's at, but um, my, or where I am at, and he's still in the community, and his dad's in the community. And you, if if you're the little kid, you know who you are. 
and he he uh he my daughter liked him and her best friend liked him well he chose the other girl and i was like at first i was like yes you know what i mean i don't have to worry about this kid anymore yep. and then i started to think about it i was like why don't you like my daughter you know what i'm saying like my daughter is awesome and so yeah. she, he chose the other friend. They became, I mean, they were going out, which in second grade is just like, you just point at someone as like, that's my girlfriend. Well, I volunteered at school a lot. I would like to say I'm a Christian man, like to say I'm a God-fearing guy, but I went on the playground, Sean. And on the playground, we were playing basketball and he happened to be on the other team. I made this, it was, it was by design. And this little joker was pretty good at basketball, but... I'm a 40 year old man from mid forties at the time. And this yeah, kid you got a foot, a foot and a half on him. Oh yeah. This, this kid goes for his first shot, Sean. And I sent that thing into the stands and then every <laughs> shot from that point forward, I was just throwing the stuff. I was bodying him up. I was making sure. And he looked at me cause he had known me and he was, uh, <laughs> I used to volunteer and he was like, Mr. C what's going on. And I just looked at him and I was like, I'm going to show you what's going on. You didn't choose my daughter. My daughter was a little bit sad. So you ain't scoring nothing today. That was not a God moment for me. Uh, I'm glad that I'm going to admit it. Can you, can you tell us about a non God moment when you were like, I get snarky or whatever it is. Let's go into that. Let's step out of pastor Sean for a second. And let's Uh go into that Sean that, that wants to body a kid up in second grade. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll give you one. It was on Twitter actually. (laughs) Yeah, it happens on social media a lot. I'm just learning, like, just, just stay away, Sean. You're, you, you can't control yourself. You don't have Sean, that. Sean, are you the Kevin Durant of pastors? Is that what you're saying? You got a burner account? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I've, like, deleted it. I'm away. So so here, here's what happened. I, um, like, it, this was, like, this was over the pandemic, actually. And then I'll give you a second instance on Instagram where your pastor really, um, he messaged me and, and checked me. And I was like, you're right. Boom. I, you know, I went and made it right. But a couple years ago, I'm on Twitter and I'm only, I was only on Twitter, like for sports mostly. I like, you're a Titans fan, irrational Titans fan. I'm an irrational Chargers fan. And you know, it's just stupid, but, (laughs) and on Twitter, like they'll put up weird, like accounts that I don't follow, you know, to try and get, maybe you'll like this or whatever. And it was like, um, the United Nations women some account like that. And it was on national women's day, international women's day. And, um, I'm very pro women. You know, my, my church is part of a denomination that's kind of seen as, um, by the world as anti women. And like, I'm one of the few churches in that denomination that have women ministers. I take a lot of heat for it. Like I'm very pro woman, (laughs) you know what I mean? But, um, it was the United nations international women's account. And it, it, a bunch of times it just said, stop interrupting women, stop interrupting women, stop interrupting women, stop interrupting like a bunch of times. And I don't know why I was in my feed and I don't know why I did this. Cause I'm just an idiot. <laughs> I typed in, I go, that's cool. But could you get me a sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was super funny, right? As I tell it, it's funny, but I could see like on Twitter, like, oh no, you don't. And then there was just some group. They Googled my name. They found out I was a pastor of a large church and they just went after me on social media. Um, our church's Google ranking, like they just started bombing our, our, all our social media pages and he's a misogynist. And I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, I had, you know, and fortunately they did it for about a week and then they moved on to attack some, some other poor soul, um, to cancel them. <laughs> So, so that, that's one. And, yeah. you know, like, I, I realized, no, I'm dumb. And then I was on a meme account uh, like a couple weeks ago and they popped up this pastor and um, I just said something funny about him. And um, I shouldn't have, that was, you know, I should, I shouldn't diss my fellow guys in my, my position. Those are my bros. You, you know what I mean? Whether yeah. they're doing good or bad, I should just like keep, stay neutral, let the world hate on them. Uh, th- this is a fraternity. I should at least, uh, you know, stay neutral on. And I, I did it and it, it was funny. And then your pastor texted me. He's like, what's up with that? And I was like, oh man, you're right. 
So I went back on and I deleted it and I, you know, all right. I said, <laughs> I had said this pastor was the Kmart version of another, of another pastor. <laughs> This is, right. This is what I but love, then, man. But then I went back on, I deleted it, and I said, hey, I put something stupid there. Who am I to say anything? I'm the indoor swap meet version of this pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, when is, when is the, the most out-of-context verse in the Bible that people use all the time? Oh, okay. Um, well, right now, it it it. it comes to a lot of times to um they'll use um they'll use what the bible says about sexuality right and um really kind of the new testament ethic of sexuality and then they'll go back and they'll use a old testament verse like you know if uh children disobey their parents you should have them stoned and they'll say well you're not doing that so why are you holding people to this sexual ethic, if, if that makes sense. Or why are you holding people it, to this if you're not following this part of the Old Testament? Okay. And and some of that, like, you know, that's a logical direction um, if you haven't read the whole Bible and understand the whole narrative arc of the Bible. Um, because what you find is um, when the Jews came out of Egypt, God gave them the law to make them a culture. They were culturally Egypt. They weren't Jewish. The, their blood was Jewish, but culturally they had been in Egypt for three, 300 years. So he gives them these laws, these traditions, this way to exist and is creating a culture out of them while they're roaming the desert of, of Sinai. Um, and what you find by the, you know, a couple thousand years later, you get to the New Testament and in the book of Acts and the Jewish Christians, because Christianity is a Jewish movement. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. They're struggling because all of these non-Jews are now becoming Christians. And they're like, well, should we make them follow all these laws? Should they get circumcised? Should they not eat pork? Should they not, you know, do all these things we're supposed to do? And the apostles who were Jewish Christians came together in the book of Acts and they, they decided, no, the Gentiles should not have to bear the yoke of um, what we've had to bear being Jews, they should abstain from sexual immorality. What the Bible sees as sexually immoral and, um, e eating food, sacrificed to idols. Right. And it doesn't mean that we, you know, we disregard all of the other things in the Bible, but they're put in their proper place. When you become a follower of Jesus, that there's a new ethic that we're to love God with our whole heart our whole mind, our whole soul, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And that that is the great commandment from Jesus. And the rest of the Old Testament is beautiful and it's it's true and no bit of it has been abolished, but it all is pointing to Jesus and what he did for us because we couldn't obey that law. That law was really intended when you read the whole narrative arc of the Bible as a as a mirror to show me how dirty my face is that I can't do it and I need someone to do it for me. And Jesus came and did it for me. So what, what happens though, is they'll nip, they'll take a verse out of the old Testament to kind of deconstruct a verse in the new Testament. So, so that it either it makes us look hypocritical or they don't have to follow it. If that makes sense. Absolutely. What about, what about Christians that take it out of context? Cause I've seen this happen a lot, especially with Philippians 4:13. When they read Philippians 4.13, they're like, God, uh, uh, you know, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But they don't read the verse before and the verse afterwards. Can <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Or can the, you, the whole passage, right? Yeah. Can you, help, can you help with this? Because people will be like, I can do all things. So everything that I can do is right. And this is what my mom taught me very early on. She said, you can do anything that you put your mind to. And then there was a caveat that just because you could do it doesn't make it right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so, but help us with the context of, you know, Philippians 413, because this is something that people get tattooed on them that, you know, they, they do charges like, yeah, I can do all things. So, you know, yeah, that's yeah. what he told me, but break it down for us, Sean. Cause this, I mean, this is going to blow your mind if you're listening. A lot of athletes, a lot of CrossFit people, like that's their verse, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. But, um, the, the context of Philippians chapter four 
is Paul is talking about being content in all circumstances, that he knows what it's like to have a lot, to have a little. Um, and it, it doesn't matter how much money you have in life. It's learning to be content in whatever place God has put you. And because of that, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. But we always look at it as it's climbing a hill. It's taking something. It's getting what's deserved to us. It's all of that. And that's just the nature of human beings. We are just really narcissistic, self-centered people. You know, no one taught our kids how to say no in mind. Like they, those were some of the first words they learned after Dada and Mama. And they just learned it because it's in, in our sinful nature. So that, that happens a lot in scripture where we kind of like, it's called eisegesis. You, you, you pick verses to support you rather than, than what's actually there and live out what's in the Bible, if that makes sense. That's exegesis is pulling out what's actually in there. Eisegesis is pulling out what I want from it so I can do what I want. So I have another one for you. <clears throat> I was sitting at the beach. My wife was, uh, I go in the morning and I get a chance to read, uh, you know, and I, I love that you read Proverbs, the pro corresponding uh, day, corresponding proverb. I love you, Sean, more than I did yep. before. Um, I am not a, a Chargers fan, uh, but I'm just joking with you. I, I, I love that. They're the lovable guys in the NFL. You can't. They're like, like the Cubs now. Yeah, absolutely. Unless you're a Raider fan, which then you should yeah. not be on this earth. Um, yes. Unless you're a Ra <laughs> unless you're a Raider fan, then that's the only people that dislike Chargers. Everyone else is like, eh, this is Chargers. You know what yeah, I mean? They're they're, they're there, <laughs> um, and and all the people in LA are like, eh, they're really here. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Who um, are they? Yeah. <laughs> so, so there was, uh, you know, I get a chance to go down and I get, uh, I'm very, very uh, blessed because I get to go in the morning and I got to go this morning and, and, uh, just sit at the beach and, and read the word. And I was reading and then I was reading in Proverbs and my wife asked me what I was reading and I was like, oh, cool. You know, I'll share it with you. Cause she, she, she was running the beach, working out, doing the steps, doing all the stuff. I wasn't trying to do that. I was just sitting, being lazy, uh, just reading the, the word. And uh, she asked me about it, and I read the proverb to her. And it talked about, you know, beware of the wayward woman and, you know, beware of adultery. And, you know, it was like, it was basically, and she, she just turned to me. She's like, why, why is the woman always got to be the bad one? Mm -hmm. And in Proverbs, a lot of times it's talking about, like, stay away from the, the wayward woman. And then it's like the woman who will uh, draw you away and stuff like that. And what God revealed to me, I want to know your side of it. Actually, you know what? Yeah. I want to hear your side of it, and then I'll tell you what he told me afterwards. Oh, yeah. Well, again, it's all context, right? So who wrote it? King Solomon wrote the Proverbs. And who is he writing it to? You see it in the first chapter. It's to his son. Ooh. So, so th this is why it, it, you know, because it's written from, by a man to a man and, um, you know, yeah, I'm worried about the wayward woman myself too. I, I'm a, I'm a man, you know, that my eyes can wander and, um, you know, and you, you get, you get tempted and that, it, that is an issue men struggle with. So, so it all goes back to context, right? So what, what he, what. God spoke to me at that time because I was stumped and I was like, man, this is a time where I'm getting to share some faith with my wife. We're talking, you know, this is great. And I'm like, but I don't have an answer because I got a daughter in my house and it's like, there's so many things, the negative woman, whatever it was, I didn't have the, the, the doctorate like you do. So I was like, I just sat and I just prayed quick. I was like, God, just help me, you know, help me out of this one. I don't know you do those, but I was like, sweet baby Jesus, you better show up on this beach now. And, yeah. uh, what he let me know is that, um, there obviously there's a, a historical context, but he said the context of it for you right now is anything that will stand in the way of my relationship with you and your relationship with me is adultery. And yeah. so that thing was the wayward woman. And I got to, and as I explained that to my wife, then she was like, oh, wow. And I was like, Phew. I was like, thank you, God, because, I mean, it, God doesn't always answer. I, and I want you guys to think this. It's like not a 1-900 number with God. But there are times where he just yeah. like, there'll be a prayer like, hey, God, can you help out on this? And then, bang, he just brings it. When's the last time that you had that, that you know, sweet baby Jesus, help, help a brother out? And then, bang, he did it for you. Uh, right then. 
when you were asking me about the Proverbs, I was like, oh yeah, I wonder why. And then I go, oh yeah, it's written to, it's written to his son. That's the, that I always go right to context, right? But uh -huh. what you did, what you did with your wife, that was right too, because that's the application, Ooh. right? When you're reading the Bible, you go to context and then, and then, okay, you, you understand the context and then you can apply a, the principle of something because sometimes it doesn't always speak to you. If you're a woman and it says, be way the wayward woman, then that doesn't speak directly to you, but what's the principle behind it, right? And that was ultimately what you were doing is you were helping um, really apply the principle that was that Solomon was writing to his son for your wife. And, and it's a bigger principle for your life. So I, I right away, I went right to context and I hadn't gone to principle yet. And then you did principle. And I didn't have that just in my pocket. Like, oh, it's this, if that makes sense. But it's just an exercise I've learned to do over the years when you interpret scripture. And I read Proverbs like for the last 20 years. So I know who it's to. And I know, you know, all of that, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, for, for me early on, I remember when I first started reading the word, um, I was, it was tough on me because my pops was like, read the word. And my pops is funny because you said that your dad called you boy. Like my dad called yeah. me boy. He would, and he was like, boy, like you need to read one page a day. And I was like, dad, this stuff is crazy. Like it's thou yeah. art and all this stuff. Yeah, and yeah. then I remember just praying and asking God, I was like, look, you know, I started reading one page a day. My dad said it was feeding like a, a child just feeding. And you don't know what you like when you're a kid. You're just hungry and you just eat. So you just eat baby food, not because you like it. It's just because it's food. And he said, think about that with the word, just one, one page a day, one page a day. And he said, set it down, don't try and understand it. He said, before long, you'll be able to gain an appetite and you'll be able to grow into it. Well, once I grew into it and I started having it, then I started to ask, like, people would talk about the word being alive, right? Mm -hmm. And you've heard this, you've spoke about this, like the word being alive and not just be, you know, we read the scriptures and then we're done. It's like the word comes alive and it examines you. Like you said, it gives you a mirror and it makes you look at yourself and all that stuff. And it was hard for me at first. And then I asked God, I was like, what do you, like, how does this, how does this, these words that were written 2000 years ago, how they become alive? And what he said to me was, you know, if you, if you're, Vision is, is blurred. You put glasses on. He said the only way that you'll be able to uh, have the word come alive is if you put the Holy Spirit on every single time that you read the word and, and the Holy Spirit will bring it to life and translate it. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to that a little bit? Because I think a lot of times people uh, get into a routine, right? And I've talked about this before. Like they get into a routine in their life and then that routine becomes their religion and they worship the routine as opposed to the reason why they were doing the routine in the first place. Yeah, I think, um, you know, routine, tradition, things like that are, are not bad. I think humans, like, we, we, we thrive in it, to be honest. Um, our kids need it. Like, we saw, like, during the pandemic, it screwed up the routine, and it just screwed up all our lives, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but th there are times where the routine and, or a tradition or something like that can also squash what's there right and um because what happens is is like our brains um it's almost like the habits we create in our life the routines we create in our life it's it's like it's like a rock and you're you're running water on a rock for millions of years what's going to happen is it creates a groove and then the water flows down that groove really fast and eventually it becomes a stream and it becomes a river right um, that, that, that's kind of how water on a rock, rock is. Well, habits are that way. It becomes this kind of stream or river. And the, the problem is though, is we can make our, our, our traditions and our, and our habits, we can kind of limit them so that the, 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 the river doesn't get bigger. If that makes sense, we limit the amount of water flowing down the rock, if that makes sense. And then it just becomes this long, narrow groove rather than this big, wide, beautiful river that, that keeps cut, cutting on the rock. And I, I, you know, I think that that happens. I'm guilty of it. Um, and then you feel weird when you, you break it up. Like I, I write my prayers in this journal every, every morning. And when some mornings I don't have time to do it and I just pray out loud in my car and I feel bad. 
even though there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? I feel some kind of cognitive dissonance that I'm not praying properly. And um, that has something to do with our psychology and our psyche. And sometimes you have to realize what's going on in your head and be self-aware that like, oh, this feeling I'm having is not a real, is not a fact. It's just how I feel because I'm used to doing it this way. Um, that That's just w- one example. But I, I think um, the habits are good. The ritual is good. You just have to evaluate it from time to time when you start feeling guilty because you're not doing it a certain way. So, Sean, as a pastor, how do you give yourself grace? Man, I think um, my my dear friend Jason Graves says, confess your sin often and just speak the, your struggles often. And, um, you, you have to, like, you have to give yourself grace if you're always pointing them out, if that makes sense. And then, um, but what about the person that points them out and then just gets down on themselves and beats the tar out of themselves? I've seen this happen with alcoholism. I've seen this with abuse, uh, with drugs where they'll, they'll, they'll maybe, you know, have some actions or some words when they were under the influence and then they come out of the influence and they remember it slightly and there's this this wreckage behind them and then they get so down on themselves because they said this thing but they don't and then when they get down on themselves then they drink more or they take yeah. more to be able to mask the pain and then they feel bad because they took all that stuff and then they beat up on themselves again and then it's this cycle and I see this cycle how do you like if you're confessing those things how do you like <clears throat> number one can you um define grace for us from a like if if my four-year-old was sitting here not a like a scholarly way but a four-year-old yeah. to understand it and then how can you confess and then and just forgive because so many people are just sitting in a place where they're beating the tar out of themselves every single day because of all the things that they did. And I find that that it's, it's holding them in bondage. Does that make sense? It's holding them yeah. in that place. Well, I, I can give you a couple things. And I think this is helpful for everyone. It's been incredibly helpful in my life. Um, for, first and foremost, I would recommend everyone read a book. Um, it's a little book. It's just a pamphlet almost by a guy named Timothy Keller. It's called the art of self forgetfulness. Um, incredibly helpful book. Um, so that's a resource, but, um, this is what I, I would say from my experience. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually working on a book about this called take off your grave clothes. And some of it is about le- learning to, um, forgive yourself and live in grace. So grace right away. Well, let's take that great. Grace is not getting what you deserve. It's that it's that it's unmerited favor, you know, that, you deserve this, but you got this instead um, at, at, a, at a four-year-old level. And how do you give yourself grace? Um, human beings, we are social animals. And you have to put yourself in a community that um, tells you the truth. Sometimes we want to be in a community that, that gives a false grace that it's, Hey, it's all okay. That that's, that's what we want to be around. So then we don't feel guilty about it. But the truth is most people feel very guilty. And a lot of Christians have just enough Jesus to feel terrible, to be honest. They, they just feel guilty all the time because they, they, they don't have a, a, a great understanding of, of the grace of God and how, the grace of God and the gospel really like frees you to not live in guilt and, and, and and to, when you do to, to not live in that, but then also to walk away from the things that make you feel guilty, if that makes sense. And here's what I would say is um, you see it with uh, let's take someone who, who's an addict, who, who's an alcoholic Um, time and time again, it's tried and true and you can send people to a place in Malibu for 90 days and get them detox and all that. And that's great. But the thing that has worked the best, it has the highest sobriety rate is Alcoholics Anonymous. Why, why is Alcoholics Anonymous work? 
um, the 12 steps seem stupid as you're going through them. But what it is, is it, it is a community of people that know you, know your proclivities, and will tell you the truth even when you don't want to hear it. That's what a sponsor is. Um, they're going to tell you the truth over your feelings, right? Because you feel guilty, you want to use again, and they're, they're going to come back and tell you the truth, like, don't do that, here's why. Um, you know, especially, uh, I've, I've been part of Celebrate Recovery for, for years, on and off. I'm part of a group, uh, it's called Celebrate Pastors Recovery, and we go through the 12 steps every couple of years together because it's just super healing. Um, whether you're an alcoholic or you're a codependent or whatever you are, whatever your hurt, your habit, your hangup is, having that community of truth tellers, when I feel guilty because I've relapsed on a sin I, I have, I've struggled with over time, them to tell me the consequences of it, but also to remind me of the grace that's in it, right? Because sometimes it feels better to just beat myself up because it's almost like I feel like I'm doing a penance. I'm whipping myself for the bad thing I did. And then they remind me of, no, Jesus already did that. Stop whipping yourself because Jesus was whipped for you. Stop beating yourself up because Jesus was beaten for you. So they remind me of that truth too. And they don't let me get away from that. But then they'll also, you know, the, in the AA, they'll remind you like, hey, listen, how'd that go for you? Are you sick and tired of being tired? Or you you going to let let this uh, play? How, how is drinking going to pan out for you in the next year? That they're not afraid to tell you the truth, that truth to you too. So I think um, intentionally building and putting in your life a community of people that tell you the truth really helps you receive grace and get grace, if that makes sense. And not all AA groups give grace. I'm just going to let you know. Um, like you need to find the, one, the ones that do. But I, I would say like a Christian-based one like Celebrate Recovery or Regen or anything like that is so helpful for anyone who, whether you're not, you're an alcoholic or, or you know, you just struggle biting your nails or you eat too much or, you know, you, you're trying to stop cussing. Like all, having a community of truth tellers on both sides is, um, man, it helps you take off your grave clothes, if that makes sense. So in our men's group, we had a discussion the other day, Sean, and I was hoping you could help me with this. Um, and we were talking about language. You just talked about the, you know, if you need to stop cussing or whatever it was. And we talked about this and he said, you know, I have a challenge with this part of it. And he said, you know, he was talking about cussing and he said, you know, um, for me to say to my son that he's awful is just the same as me dropping the F-bomb on him. And at first I was like, nah, 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 nah. And he's like, no, but the meaning behind it. He said, so yeah. why is it such a big deal that I don't say the S word or I don't say the F word or I don't say these things because the meaning behind it. And he said, in our family, you know, I'm paraphrasing. So you know who you are, Craig, out there, you know, and I'm, but I'm trying to, it was such an amazing discussion. He's like, well, what if that word, that cuss word to the society doesn't really have any power in my house? Is it, why is it such a big deal for me to teach my kids not to say that when, you know, I, I it's not a taboo for us? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say like right away, yeah, you should work on the calling your son awful first because that's the real curse. Mm -hmm. if and I want to make sure, too, he wasn't saying that he called his son awful. He was just saying that would be worse, like if I called my son awful. You know what I mean? It, like, is. it, it is, yeah. So, yeah, so maybe he doesn't do that. But, like, you know, those – really, that's what a curse word is, right? Okay. It's, it's meant to, to, to curse, to put down. So we have cuss words and the, the reality is like, if you cuss, it does, it's not going to keep you out of heaven. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's not a, like a salvation issue, but I would say, you know, um, it does say in the new Testament, I believe it's in the book of Corinthians or Colossians, like do not let unwholesome words come out of your mouth. So learning to stop cussing is a, a way of, kind of putting off the flesh, right? If I, if I, if I bang my head, 
I don't know why, but like the F word feels much better when I say it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It comes out, you're like, mother, you know, kind of, but I'm learning to not live in that impulse, right? And what happens is when you learn to not live in that impulse of say cussing, it makes the bigger temptations easier to reject, if that makes sense over time. So you, it, it's a practice of putting off the flesh. And to some people, like in your house, it may not be an issue, but um, you know that that is going to be an issue for your kid when he shows up in first grade and you know calls the teacher an mf'er, <laughs> you know, out, out of love. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's not beneficial for your family if if that makes sense and and everything is permissible and not everything is beneficial mm -hmm. so and and the bible talks about that and that that's where like i think sometimes like christians get caught up on it, it says it says do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth you're sinning you're doing bad and it, it's not behavior modification it's why because that does something to your soul if that makes sense and, and, and it does something in, in the long run that you'll love God better if you can learn to control your speech. Just like I'm learning to control my snarky thumbs. Right? I think they're funny. I think it's, I think it's hilarious. You should get a burner account and then just text me and, and say, Kelly, I hit this guy on this Twitter. And it, I, it was, uh, you, we, let's just call it Secular Sean. That should be your Twitter name. Secular yeah, it'll, Sean. It'll bring yeah. out the worst in my soul, though. It's the you know thing. what I mean? <laughs> that, that part of me, I don't want to feed that, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's that's really, I, I think, why, um, you know, yeah, we, we want to, as, as a believer, we don't want to cuss. Um, it's not going to stop us from going to heaven. God's not in heaven being like, oh, my gosh, stop saying that. But. What happens is when I learn to control my impulses and my language and my, my, my speech is thought through, I do know this, um, God is going to use me in a greater way. J just, just a reality. And he's going to use your words and your words will be more powerful when you've learned to have control over them. It's just like if you give your kids money and they waste it all the time, I don't know if I want to give them money. What what accent does God have in your life? Like, does he have a, a strong English accent when he talks to you? Does he have a Southern draw? What does he What does he have when he talks to Sean? <laughs> um, gosh, I I I always he, feel like Morgan I'm, Freeman. I'm, I'm, well, that would be if I had to if I had to portray God to someone, it's going to be that voice, like you know, old and wise, <laughs> right? I'm Morgan Freeman, you know, kind of thing, but. I always picture God speaking in my voice. And that's probably because, you know, as a human, I'm naturally narcissistic. Uh, <laughs> right. Where, you know, like, I'll, you know, there'll be times where I, I honestly believe the Holy Spirit's speaking to me, but it's using my voice. It's going, oh, well, how's that working for you, Beatty? <laughs> and I, I, I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I think that's how God speaks to, to my soul, if that makes sense, is he uses my own voice, my own words. But I know that one's from God because it's moving me towards godliness, if that makes sense. I, th I think you're one of the coolest and, and most talented wordsmiths also, meaning that you, you are able to live your life. You live your life as an absolute human being, and then you take those things, and then you weave them together and, and drop a point on people when they don't even realize it's coming. And the, the time that you did this to me, um, I was sitting in the front row, and you told a story about Michael Jordan. And I was like, how is he going to bring this story of Michael Jordan back to church because I was just like Michael I, you I heard Michael Jordan and I was like I'm in I love the shoes the fours are the best I don't care anybody out there that's a shoe head <laughs> sneaker head I'm saying the They're fours the fours were the best I'm, I'm down yeah. with the threes but the fours were the best but that was because of personal experience my dad made eleven hundred dollars a month uh, before taxes we lived in a double wide mobile home 40 miles from our high school and my parents bought a pair of fours for me and a pair of fours for my brother in one month that means two hundred and fifty dollars out of that <laughs> probably $700 that he got for the month, they spent on shoes when we lived Dang. in a mobile home. Wow. So that's why the fours, for me, 
are the greatest. But when you started talking about Jordan, Sean, I was like, yeah. how, how's this dude going to bring this back to any lesson or any principle? Can you break it down? Because this one was probably one of my favorites. Well, so, yeah. So um, Jordan um, wrote, he wrote in his book, and it, it's a famous story about him, but ba basically he had this guy, um, I forget his name, it's Bob something. He was an NBA exec, uh, I, I think for the Hornets or and um, it was in the off season and they had went and gone and played golf and they were going to go out to dinner and they went back to Bob's uh, condo or house and um, they were getting ready and it was getting cold. And Jordan said, Bob, can I, can I borrow a sweatshirt? And Bob's like, yeah, go in my closet and get one. And he went in his closet and in, in his closet, he had a bunch of Jordan Nike gear that Michael Jordan had given because they were friends. And then, um, you know, this guy is an NBA executive, so he was also friends with another player named Ralph Sampson, who was um, kind of a contemporary in college of Jordan during during that time, and, and he was a big NBA player at the time, and he was sponsored by Puma. So he had a bunch of Puma gear that Ralph Sampson had given him, too, and Jordan proceeds to, you know, walk out, throw all the Puma gear on the floor of the, the living room in front of the kitchen, grabs a knife or, or scissors and begins to cut it all up in front of him and just to shreds. And then he picks it up to, and he's about to take it outside the dumpster and he takes it outside the dumpster. And Bob's like, what is going on? And Jordan gets in his face and he says, if you're going to, if you're going to be with me, you don't ride the fence. It's all Nike basically is, is the kind of the gist of the story. And I thought that was such a great story, and it speaks to um, to God. Is God kind of like in our in our faith? Like you know, the only thing riding the fence with one foot in the world and one foot saying, "Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I like to party," kind of you know, or I believe in Jesus, but I'm you know I'm going to do it my way. Like the only thing riding the fence does is it gives you a sore rear end. And, and Jesus has this way when you read in the Gospels and, um, and really the whole New Testament about pushing you off the, the fence that, hey, are you, are you going to, were you created by God to live for God or are you just going to live this life for yourself? And I thought that was such a great story to illustrate that concept. So, you know, I used it as the intro to the message. Sean, you are phenomenal. I mean, being able to spend time with you is is unbelievable, man. I would like to, uh, and when I ask this, I, I ask this in front of everyone who's listening, all the people out there watching, and I want to thank all of you, um, because you can't say no when I ask you this because people are watching and people are listening. So I, I'm going to ask you to come on the show again. I want to have you on multiple times because your mind, man, we have just scratched the surface, you know, to be able to uh, spend some time together. And uh, will you come on the show again? Oh, bro, for sure. <laughs> there we go. So that's like okay. asking your parents, can uh, can so-and-so spend the night in front of the other parents, too? Because then you don't want to look right. like the bad parents. Um, that's right. So No, no, I, I would love to, man. It's fun talk, chatting with you, chopping it up. So what, um, let me ask you this, too. What, like, if you got a chance, we go back to the room with, with your wrestling belt and, um, sweet baby Jesus with the Morgan Freeman voice and, uh, that, or, or sometimes your voice or whatever it is, he's sitting up in the room mm -hmm. and, uh, he's got another two minutes and he says, uh, what do you, what do you want to ask me about the situation with your wife? What do you say? Oh man. I think, um, what would I ask? That, that is a tough one. The, the, I, what I want to ask, I'm afraid to ask. Does so that make ask, sense? So ask. What would it be, Sean? Yeah. Well, I would tell him, like, what I want to ask you, I'm afraid, and it's how does this end? Th th does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then as I say that out loud, even, like, I, I, I think he's going to give me the bigger picture. That, that's what I would hope for is I, I want to see the bigger picture. I know how it ends. I know how it ends for all of us. Like I'm just here to encourage everyone listening. You're all going to die. <laughs> like that's just kind of a reality of, of human life. 
and some of us sooner, some of us later. Um, and, um, I would love if the Lord would miraculously heal my wife and we would give testimony to it and we would point to him and we still already do. Like she was, she, I was supposed to be single by now. You know, we went to lunch yesterday to celebrate that day and she's like, yeah, you'd probably be on a date right now. <laughs> it went the way the doctor thought it was going to go. And, um, the, just the, 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 the truth of the matter is we're all going to die, but I want to know like, okay, Lord, what does this story look like a hundred years from now? Hmm. What does it look like a thousand years from now? Um, because I, I think if I had that, it makes the anxiety and the fear and the pain of what's one day going to happen much easier, if that makes sense. Sean, what do you wish that your parent or your, your kids and your wife knew about you? or more about you? Um, I wish my kids knew how much I, I pray for them, that they would know, know Christ better than I do. What do you wish that your congregation would encourage you more in? Because the reason why I say this in the context of it, and you're a context guy, but the context, uh, the fact of the matter is most of the time we as men we don't get encouraged on the things that we want to get encouraged on. Like we'll <laughs> do something, we'll do some things, and it's not like we're doing it to get a, a, adoration, but we do it and we're like, we did this thing. Like I wish I could get you know somebody to just you know edify that part of it and to encourage that part of it. And a lot of times we don't get it. And, you know, we don't have people who speak in life. So if you were you know it, it, your congregation will listen. But what do you wish you what do you wish they would encourage you more in that, uh, you know, some of the things that maybe the little things that that you wish that someone would say, Sean, like, great job on that one, man. That was phenomenal. <sighs> um, I think. Um, I mean, they're, they're very encouraging. I'm, I'm trying to think. I think I, I would say. They would, I, I would love encouragement in, in the sense that like, Sean, we, we, we trust that you have, you're seeing a bigger picture than us, that you, you wake up every day thinking about this church and we wake up Sundays sometimes thinking about it. What do you wish that your wife knew more or maybe something that you don't tell her enough. And I know you tell her you love her. I mean, going through what you're going through, all those things, but what does she not hear enough from Sean? Oh, um, man, how brave she is. Yeah. Tearing up a little bit, to be honest. Um, she's an incredibly brave person. You know, the, that cancer affected her speech. Um, like she has struggled, she struggles finding words and um, she stutters sometimes. And um, like being a pastor's wife, she's always been an introvert. She always kind of wanted to always stand in my shadow. And since she's um, had this cancer and it affected her speech, like she's been the opposite, like she's kind of stepped into the, the limelight and, and said, no, this is me. And this is what God is doing. And, and it, it's almost like in the Bible, Jacob had this limp and, and God broke Jacob's hip to give him this limp, to remind him that to rely on him and everyone that saw Jacob would know that he wrestled with God. And, and gosh, my, my wife, like, you know, she spoke to a group of pastors last pastors' wives last year. She, you know, before the, before cancer tried to take her speech, she never she never public spoke ever as a pastor's wife. She was not going to do it. And now that cancer tried to take her speech, like you know, the devil tried to take her speech, and she's got a greater voice for Christ now. And um, that there's a level of bravery that blows my mind. So Sean, we uh, you know with our with our men's group we do this, and with the with the hideout, um, 
we based it around it. Two things. One was be vulnerable, um, but to bring out vulnerability, I believe that speaking life into people creates a vulnerability. Um, Can you take a second, look into the screen, use her name, and go into the specific stuff, but speak some life to your wife? Yeah. So my wife's name is Kelly, so I'm not talking to you, Kelly. I'm talking to Kelly, i.e. Yeah, you are the bravest woman that I know. And, um, you know, I can't, because you're so brave, I, I don't ever feel sorry for myself because you don't. And um, you have no idea how inspiring that is to me. Sean, I want to thank you for being vulnerable. Um, you know, because, you know, a lot of times people say things are off limits or don't talk about this or don't talk about that. But when we first started off the podcast, that was immediately you said, no, I'm open. Um, I told you at that time that I was recording that and that I would hold it up in a court of law. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I started the podcast because of my kids, right? Yeah. And um, I did it because of my kids because I wanted my daughter, McKenna, 13 years old, amazing artist. Uh, you know, she's in the drama department, and I'm going to tell you guys about that here in a second. Um, she loves it. She found her light. My son is like, my son's happy just to, the, cause the sky is blue and you know, like he has dirt under his fingernails. He's like, yeah, dad, check this out. He's just the, jo- like a bundle of joy and light. This kid is not, I mean, it's amazing to be able to be around him, but I wanted to take people like yourself, iconic people like yourself. And especially, I mean, you're an icon in the Fresno area and to all the people in your, the community, um, that come to your church, that hear you speak. You're an icon to me, like sitting in the audience. I'm like, wow, this guy is the mo- this this guy's one of the best I've ever seen. But I wanted to take icons like you and I wanted to show my kids that there's no idols in life, that they shouldn't have idols, that they should these these people are just regular people. Um, they have phenomenal attitudes and crazy work ethics. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. Oh yeah. So Maddox and McKenna, here's what I want you to know. Um God has an incredible plan for your life, for both your lives, you as individuals. Um, And it is way better than any plan you have. And if you'll remember that, um, your your life will be blessed. That's all I can tell you. Like, there, there's no plan that you'll make that is better than the plan that God has for you. That as much as you think of yourself and as much as that, he thinks more of you. And um, know that, that there's, you're loved more than you could ever imagine, not just by your dad, but by your heavenly father. Um, we're more sinful than we could ever imagine, but you're more loved than you could ever imagine as well. So follow his plan because it will be better, I promise you. Sean, you have been absolutely phenomenal. Better than better than build. Um, the the reason why I say it is because like you have an expectation. You know, you have an expectation of somebody, and you're you're blown away. I was literally like I was. I had to strap my seatbelt on when you came to daybreak, and I was just writing and writing and writing and writing. And then I was like, and I I remember praying, just please God, like I want to meet him. Like I want to I want to get him because I know that the people are going to be clamoring for him after church and stuff like that. And the fact that like I, you stopped, man, and I, I, I can't thank you enough for that. Um, you stopped, and it was like time stopped, and no one existed, and you just talked to me. And it was just, it was quick, man, and, and, but it makes a difference. You make a difference in so many people's lives. I, I'm so, uh, you know, I, I think everyone out there, if you're in the Fresno area, if you guys get a chance, like, go, go and see the Clovis Hills Community Church. Like, I mean, go and see, again, experience them, whether it be through YouTube on, the, uh, on his website, uh, Sean Beatty, not Beatty, um, dot com. But I want to thank you, man. I, and, uh, and now's the time where I want to thank every single one of you guys out there. Everybody that's listening right now that has made us the, in the top 1% 
the top 1% globally. And it hasn't been because we ran any ads. We do have sponsors on the podcast, but we don't run any ads. And I have people reach out to me every single day. I could promote your podcast. I can make sure that you have these organic listeners and we could force people to be able to do this. And I said, you know what? I'd much rather do it organic. Maybe that's the silliest thing that I've ever done in my life. Um, but because of you, every single one of you who have been riding with us since the beginning, we're in the top 1% globally as far as all podcasts. And I'm honored for that. And I want to just keep bringing you amazing content like what Sean brought to us today. And um, the shameless promotion, guys, is we have a new sponsor. It's called uh, Raven Drum. The Raven Drum Foundation is uh, by Rick Allen. And Rick Allen, for those of you who know that name, it's the, uh, the drummer uh, from Def Leppard who just went into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And this man is uh, dealing with uh, mental health issues as far as like helping people to overcome them, PTSD, um, and he's doing it through drum circles. I just got a chance to be a part of one up in Orange County, and it was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the drummer from uh, Godsmack, from uh, uh, Widespread Panic, from Lenny Kravitz, from uh, Elton John, and... Um, uh, let's see, Little Richard, Elvis, Guns N' Roses, and I got to sit in this drum circle and be able to, like, you know, I, I have no drumming skills at all, but I tell you, I beat the tar out of that drum that night, and uh, what it helped was all those people together coming together for a great cause, which is Raymond, Raven drumfoundation.org. It's one of our sponsors. I want you to reach out to that. And the other one is the fact that, uh, you know, it's Alviara Oaks Middle School Drama Department. Um, I tell you, when, when you have budget cuts, the first to get cut is the performing arts. And every single kid out there needs the performing arts. All of us need that. And there's a link in the bio. And, uh, you know, we want to help my uh, daughter to be able to have her musical in the spring. And we're going to do it. We're raising $32,000. We just went over nine grand in three weeks because of all of you. And I want thank you so much um so uh and and every single one of our sponsors from samaritan's feet to uh squeeze dried uh to uh car uh, cardenas law group finley uh finley uh, volvo cars of las vegas the sisu uh, uh, agency um let's see solo.to all these sponsors that have rode with us the whole entire time i just want to thank you uh the mina group table one uh we want to thank you so much for all that you're doing uh, that way so that's my shameless promotion sean and uh i want to thank you my man for taking your time because you have been absolutely phenomenal and i can't wait to have you on again hey man thank you i'm excited you got so, it a blessing. you are we'll officially you, you are officially off the hot seat <laughs> 